lecture and report session. Uh, I'm not always an event person, I'm a designer and I often ask myself that very question. The last few years have told me it's a little bit of an internet cynic, so hopefully this session will help me feel a little bit better on that. First of all, we've got um, the quest for an internet that serves us by Cassia Odrzek and Stefan Bach. Yay! Good afternoon. I had a dream. <laughs> I actually dreamt tonight that there were just five of you in this presentation, and I woke up really relaxed. I thought that's going to be easy. There's uh, quite some more of you today, but that's great. And we're happy that also in the late afternoon, uh, so many people decided to come uh, to our session. But you probably are also a little bit tired, so I'm going to start with some hard facts. Did you know that by 2020, there will be 30 billion IoT devices connected to the internet? But at the same time, an analysis of 10 million leaked passwords showed that the most commonly used password is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. There is a social network called AHWA that enables LGBT communities to communicate anonymously with peers all around the world. But at the same time, the seven most popular social networks I owned only about uh, by three companies. Did you know that the tech industry uses more energy, electricity, than the airplane industry? But at the same time, there is an AI bot in Brazil called Serenata del Amor that holds politicians accountable. So you might be thinking now, is the internet healthy? Is it serving us, our society? Or is it unhealthy? Is it damaging us? Maybe you're here to hear it from us. After all, we named our session whether the internet is healthy. Maybe you are expecting some kind of score. But the answer is, as usual, also in life, it's complicated. My name is um, Kasia Odorosek. I'm a, by education, a lawyer and political scientist, but by heart, a long time digital rights activist. And I think about this issue a lot in my private life and in my professional life. I work for Mozilla Foundation uh, on an internet on a project called the Internet Health Report, and I'm here with Stefan. Yeah, hi. I'm the uh, data and uh, research analyst for the Health Report, and I have a background in media communication studies. And basically, my job is to look into the studies that we can include to talk about the health of the internet. Right, many of you probably are familiar with uh, the work of Mozilla as the creator of the Firefox browser, but Mozilla is much more than that. The foundation, the foundation we do a lot of advocacy, awareness work, uh, we see internet as a public resource and we're trying to keep it open and accessible to all. And the Internet Health Report is a part of this work. It's an annual open source publication where we gather stories, so we interview people, we visualize data and talk about studies. We're trying to answer the question whether the internet is a force for good or whether not, and above all, who and how is doing something about it, just like many of you today in this room. And also, I imagine that many of you here are researchers and civic tech activists, so you, on a daily basis, you deal with the question how to leverage technology for public good. And I imagine also that you sometimes wonder what does it really mean, public good, especially in the times when many product decisions and development that are very made with well intentions, they have many negative unintended consequences. So we're here not to give you a ready-made answer, obviously, but in the next 20 minutes, we're going to present a, net, a framework that we developed at Mozilla with many partners, a framework called the Internet Health that gives us a way to think about the internet and its own complexity, that gives us guiding questions to understand which kind of internet do we want to have and where we are now. Um, and by the end of the session, hopefully, you're also going to find it useful, maybe as a tool in your work, how to think about this thing, how to think about the internet as an ecosystem, how to connect the dots, and also how to use this framework as a tool to leverage change on a local or global level. So how are we going to do it? Uh, first, we're going to present you the framework. It consists of five issues. We're going to shortly dive into each of the issues and explain their meaning, and also try to think about how this applies to civic tech. 
Then we're going to shortly tell you about how do we put the internet health report together, because it's a pretty unusual thing, our process. And then Stefan will tell you more about data and research and how he works with researchers, academics around the world uh, to do data visualizations. And finally, I'll tell you a little bit about how people and organizations are already using the Internet Health Report um, in their work. Uh, with hope that maybe you can also find it useful to advocate for your cause. So you probably already noticed that when we talk about Internet Health, uh, we don't mean it in a medical sense. It's not about internet being sick or healthy doctors, hospitals, and so on. But it's uh, more about the public good, right? Whether it helps us or it harms us. And uh, when you think about your work, I would argue that Civitex is contributing to a healthier internet. But at the same time, a healthy internet, a healthy ecosystem is a foundation for civic tech to have actual impact. If the system is distorted, so might be the impact of your work as well. If you imagine the intern being an unsafe place or an unwelcoming place, it's going to be difficult if you operate in such a system to get the impact that you're uh, intending to have. So let's have a look at the framework. These are five issues. These are lenses which help us um, to analyze uh, internet. We first ask uh, whether the internet is safe. So we talk about privacy and security. And the internet is now our environment, right? It's where we live, where we love, where we communicate. And we want to feel like ourselves. I think you would agree. But you only can feel like yourself if you can trust the system that protects you, if you have actually trust. And I think in the last years and months, we've seen so many headlines about one breach after another. I think, at least me, personally, I lost some of this trust. My personal credit card data was leaked out after I bought a yoga mat in the US store. I got a notification from the shop two months after, telling me to change my, um, to check with my bank if everything's okay. That's a bit too late. So, our financial, social, political, and the most intimate data might um, expose us to harm once it's leaked. In the upcoming report, uh, we're going to publish the next report in April 2019. We're going to be also talking about the threat that comes from sharing DNA data. But what about civic tech? When you think about privacy and security, that should also definitely be a concern. And I wanted to ask you here in the room, how many of you think that the technology you're building or it's being built as part of civic tech do you think it's secure? And does it consider the privacy of users? Uh, how many of you think that it is? Just a few hands. And how many of you don't know? And it should be <laughs> that not so many, so many hands. I think that also is a signal that that should become a bigger priority. Uh, people trust. Uh, trust uh, when you when you uh, wanna uh, I don't know when you, you offer services by when you have office, the government offers services and so on that should be that should be a place where where the users and the citizens can trust you if you lose the stress one time it's gonna be very hard to to get it back um, the next. Um, the next uh, issue that we ask, uh, the question we ask is how open is the internet? So that's an issue that in civic tech field you're very familiar with. Like the openness of the internet um, is, is, is part of it. That's, that's how internet came to be, how we know it. It's, a, it's the underlying infrastructure of the internet that enables participation, innovation, and so on. So we kind of take it as a given. But Right now, at least at Mozilla, we're talking about the so-called third way of open, because the context changed a bit. And the openness is a constant threat. We always need to fight for it. But especially in 2017, the debate sharpened when we, um, when we, disc uh, when we uh, witnessed a lot of debate about misinformation, hate speech, uh, and harassment. And people started asking, how can we have an internet that is both open and inclusive? So there is a tension there. Um, at the same time, there's a lot of debates around copyright. Right? There is uh, governments that are shutting internet down uh, just as they please. At the same time, 
we have corporations who are on enclosing control over web technologies. Most recently, there is so much debate about artificial intelligence and how open is how open it should be. How do we uh, keep the corporations and the AI accountable? It's also something I think is relevant for civic tech as well. If in the future you're going to be using it or maybe using it already, you would like to know what goes inside the algorithm. Also the question like who's going to build the machine learning solutions and artificial intelligence that benefits our societies? What are the incentives at play? And so on. So in the upcoming report, we're also going to be talking about uh, exactly these issues. Artificial intelligence will be a big topic. The third issue of our framework is uh, digital inclusion. Um, so this inclusiveness I just mentioned. So we ask who is welcome online. And probably most of you already heard that uh, half of the population is online already. That means uh, half of the people are offline. But even within the people who are online learning, there is a big digital divide. And it's still growing. So it's not only about having access to internet, but also how fast is your internet and who has access to it, and how does this access look like. Um, a healthy internet is a fast internet. And the same applies to, to civic tech, right? These are the questions like, who's building civic tech technology and for whom? Who can benefit from it? How do you create safe and welcoming spaces that consider such factors as gender and age, geography, speed, and so on? Um, Next uh, issue is web literacy. So we ask who can succeed online. This issue is tightly connected to digital inclusion. And we say that, we said Mozilla is getting online isn't enough. So it isn't enough only to consume the internet, but it's, we want everybody to be able and have the skills to participate uh, and to co-create the web. So it's getting easier and easier now. It seems that web literacy is, is our grasp. We have a lot of devices that have intuitive uh, interfaces and so on. Even people who are not able to read can now access the internet. But these are just the skills that we pick up on the way. There is a lot of skills that we still need to acquire as a new digital citizens, let's say, to uh, tap into the full uh, pool of opportunities that the internet offers us, or to avoid the risks. And that's especially true for groups that are vulnerable, for example, activists that are prosecuted um, in, um, in the countries with authoritarian governments, or um, LGBT communities, and so on. So that's also another issue that I think the civic tech field needs to think about. And I, um, I'm aware of a research, but it's own my society's research about who benefits from, from, um, from civic tech. We also should ask the questions do the people who you address with the tools you're building, do they have skills to actually use them? And do you understand the environments they're embedded with? In. And finally, who controls the internet? Here we talk about decentralization. I personally think it's a crown jewel in our framework. Um, as we all know, we have a few large players, five of them in the United States, and um, some of them in the China, which is world on its own right now that dominate much of our online experience. But we think that the internet is healthier when it's controlled by many. And um, you, I'm not going to list all the problems that result from the extreme consolidation of power that, that we're witnessing right now online. But we need to start asking questions, how do we rebalance the power between the users and the big corporations that control our user experience? There is no easy answers to that, but maybe we can think about peer-to-peer -peer solutions. We can start discussing business models, alternative business models, such as there's a movement of platform cooperatives rising, uh, and so on. I think this is also relevant for civic tech. To me, it seems as it's redistribution of power and you know, letting the citizens participate in common decision-making is at its core of civic tech. But at the same time, you can look at your own field and ask yourself, is it centralized or is it decentralized? Who controls it? Who's funding it? Who takes decision? Who ends up building civic tech? That also applies to the infrastructure that civic tech relies on, right? Which infrastructure are you using to be most effective and which incentives are there at play? All right, so we went through the five issues. 
I hope I wasn't too fast, but I seen Steph already looking at me. <laughs> um, so hurry up. So this is the framing, frame, uh, framework we work uh, with to create the Internet Health Report. These are the questions we ask ourselves. So now a couple of words about how we put the report together. The report started us in 2017. Uh, so now in April we're going to be publishing the second full version. It's a collaborative effort. So it was designed from the very start as a shared resource. But we're not doing it alone, we're not sitting in Berlin or in Toronto and writing it down, which we think is important for internet. We actually do it publicly. We do a public call for ideas. So we did it in October last year via Twitter and um, on our website. We asked what should go into the next report? What do you think is relevant for the report uh, for, for the internet? What's healthy, what's unhealthy? And to almost our surprise, we got more than 300 people who submitted substantial ideas by Twitter, but we also got really long essays via email, people pulling their hearts out, telling like what's important for them. And many of these ideas ended up in the report that we're gonna publish in April. Um, the second part of the collaborative effort is that we're working with a world, worldwide um, network of experts, allies, people from the Web Foundation, Access Now, and so on, and they actually line, uh, do line item edits uh, in the drafts of the report, making it better. Uh, that, of course, our editor, Solana Larsen, who is in Berlin, that gives her a lot of sleepless night because it's an excruciating process. But it makes the report so much better, and uh, there's a much stronger feeling of co-ownership. And how we work with data, uh, Stefan will tell you more about it. Yes, thank you. So uh, I will try to be quick. So. Um, basically, this collaborative effort is also influencing the way we work with data. So I try always to include the researchers whose data we use in the report, asking for clarifications, but also inviting them to provide feedback on early drafts, for example. And I'm sure that many of you here have access to interesting data or study or uh, do research themselves. And there's so much out there that we're not aware of that we would love you to get in touch with us. And I just want to outline some of the very basic criteria that we use to select data and studies. So the first one that you already see here is that we are interested in studies that have a global perspective. And when we say global perspective, we mean global relevance. This can either mean that the data or the studies is really uh, global in scope, but that's of course the exception. What is much more common and just as interesting to us are studies and data that uh, help us to put a global phenomenon into context, so basically to see how a global phenomenon manifests itself in a particular context. So, uh, for example, a study about misinformation in India, for example, is totally interesting to us, especially if we have other studies and data that help us to contextualize the situation and get this more transnational perspective. Um, the second aspect that is important to us when we select studies is that we're always interested in trends, of course, because this is an annual report that tries to assess current developments on the internet. So if we have a study or data that shows us whether something got healthier or unhealthier over time, that's always something that is interesting to us. Um, but it doesn't always have to be about trends. We are also interested in studies that help us to understand connections and dimensions of particular phenomena. So next year's report, we will, for example, try to show the connections between misinformation campaigns, harassment against journalists, and the question of social media platform governance. Um, and yeah, this is, the last point is pretty obvious, but uh, if you have a detailed methodology section and access to the data that you have, that's very helpful. Um, the methodology section is usually not the problem. Most of the studies we do will have a good methodology section. What is sometimes missing, though, and this is why I want to point it out, is a clear description about the limitations of the study. Often knowing what the data is not telling us is just as interesting for us as the actual findings, so we can put it into perspective. And as you can see on the slide, um, if we have access to the data, we will take a closer look at it, uh, and it enables us to come up with our own story suggestions. I just want to emphasize that we're not only interested in quantitative study or research, we're just as interested in qualitative research, even though in qualitative research you often don't have data to visualize or you cannot share the data for privacy reasons, for example. But that doesn't mean it's not interesting to us. Like a qualitative study about misinformation in India, to use this example again, is just as interesting to us as a quantitative study about the same subject. And um, with that, I will give it back to Kazi. 
And to the last uh, part of our presentation, how can you use the report? So Stefan told you a little bit about how you can contribute to the report with your research, but you can also use the report, um, the framework itself of the report that we're producing for uh, your own cause. So to give you a couple of examples of how it's being used already, the New York City um, created their own uh, local internet health report. They used the framework of the five issues and then they turned to the communities in the city and they told stories, for example, how open data is being used uh, for uh, rent control in the city and so on. And we're working also with a um, conference in Latin America that's going to produce a whole internet health track as part of the conference. We're also going to produce some locally relevant, regionally, regionally uh, relevant content with them that also will be turned into local health report. And how why is this good? Um, we found it a very useful tool to gather communities, work on these issues, uh, to connect the dots, to connect the communities with each other, and also to uncover research that is locally relevant. doesn't have to be global in this case, in the local health report, that it's locally relevant. And then, once you visualize it, you can start using it for advocacy. Um, we also had cases of integration of the report in curriculums. Um, a professor in Toronto, as well as a teacher in Cairo, um, integrated the report as part of their uh, lessons and the whole uh, student's course. And we have dozens and dozens of events all around the world happening um, where the Internet Health Report is a conversation starter uh, to again talk about the issues and the Internet and how it's perceived uh, on a local level. Um, so please we're here uh, to also learn from you um, and to involve you in our work uh, if you're up for it and to make our work available and useful to you. These are our email addresses. We're here for the whole conference today and tomorrow. Uh, the first one is mine. If you want to do something with the report, the second one is Stefan. If you would like to, if you have some research or you heard about the research we could use, just hit us up. And most importantly, on April 24, uh, the next internet health report is coming to the internet near you. So stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll do questions at the end. There we go. Well, I need to change it. So next we have uh, more Rubenstein and Tim Davies talking about the state of open data. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm very loud. At, do I need a microphone? Okay, hey, Mike, no, no, no. I'll be fine. Hi, welcome. Uh, this is really exciting for Tim and I because we've been working on this for 18 months and we can finally discuss it publicly and tell you what we think for now. Uh, so we are the state of open data. So what the hell is the state of open data? We are a very ambitious research, been done for 18 months. We're having 66 authors, 37 chapters. One of the authors in the room uh, here, Barbara, uh, looking at open data from different perspectives. Our idea is to look at a decade of open data, sometimes a bit more, and try to be very critical and understand what is the history of open data and maybe where we're gonna move forward and how we can basically shape open data um, in the coming years, and I was thinking on Rebecca's um, keynote this morning and the stage of the civic tech, and there's some similarities and some stuff that are different. Um, also, this is very qualitative research. Uh, I think it's interesting, so I'll tell you also why. So why are we doing the state of open data now? So if we're looking from the Obama Declaration of Open Data to, from 2009 until now, we had many changes, uh, and we think this is time to take stock of open data and understand where we, where we were and how we're going. But also, a thought, if you are a practitioner new to open data, you don't really have one source to go and understand what was done before you, when and how, and this is where we started with this ambitious project of starting to understand how different sectors, different regions, different uh, stakeholders are looking at open data and what we can learn from it. So we hope that this will be a very also practical guide to people from different type of um, stakeholders to understand and work with open data. We want it to be useful. We also want it to be um, academic enough and rigorous enough so we can support it. So we designed 
a very nice complex methodology that's not always academic, but we think it's helping us to move forward. Um, so the state of open data started in, in um, stages, and we believe in the state of open data that a good research methodology is also open, participatory, and try to be inclusive. We do understand that we can't include all people all the time, but we try to be as inclusive as possible and see different lenses and different points of view. So each chapter uh, started with their um, authors looking at specific questions of environment scan. Basically, try to understand what is the history, issues that the thing that should be discussed, who, um, evidence, and resources. Then what we've done, which was for us was new, is that we put all of them on a Google Doc and ask people to contribute to it. We had 145 different contributions for a topic like open data. It's pretty nice. Uh, and besides of our authors, so with it we have like 200 different contributions of people discussing with one another uh, and giving input into the research. And that input help the um, our different author to shape their chapters and write them um, going forward. Then we try to do what every good um, research do is to give it to a peer review. It's not very academic peer review what we've done, but we did basically ask from a group of practitioners and people from academia and from government to tell us basically uh, what they think is missing and what can work. So they have all these prompts that are here. Uh, we then send it back for the reviewer for writing a draft, and maybe two, and maybe three. It depends on like, how many feedback we got. Uh, and hopefully, not hopefully, we will be publishing the full report uh, in May at the OGP Summit. Um, so I'm now going to hand over to Tim who will tell you what we found out in the meanwhile. Yeah, so I'm feeling this session as a whole is trailers for upcoming reports. <laughs> you've, you've got your April reading list sorted. Uh, next up is your May reading list. Uh, and this is really useful for us to have a first chance to play these thoughts back. The final draft of the conclusion goes in in about 10 days time. So your feedback will be really valued. What we've sought to do in this project is look at the, the landscape of open data through five different lenses. Um, one of those cross-cutting, four of them become the sections of our book. So the first lens has been a historical look. We say we're taking a, a 10 year view of what's happened in open data. And you saw from Rebecca this morning this kind of sense that we've been through some periods in civic tech. Open data is a kind of subset of civic tech or an overlapping bit of the Venn diagram has done similar. We had our inception period, we had systematization, we had expansion, um, and we are very much in this period of re-evaluation, introspection, reflection as we all try and work out what this stuff we've been working on means uh, today. Um, and Amidia and Luminat have also done some work where they find these phases. Now I've, I've sort of graphed this a little bit to, to say expansion there is the peak of government excitement around the world and we are past that peak. Mm -hmm. We've got to be realistic, we're past the time when there will be big policy declarations talking about open data in that language. Um, so then when we started to look at a regional lens, that raised some interesting questions. Does that mean that we're going into a period where open data is kind of heading into a terminal decline? Or are we seeing regions adapt and engage with open data in different ways? And what we see in the different, we had different authors look at their regions, explore what's going on, and we see different narratives emerging to sustain uh, open data work. So in MENA, for example, it's wrapped up in a narrative of data-driven innovation. In Africa, we see a much tighter link to sustainable development data agendas and national statistics offices um, and uh, framing there. In Europe, there's been this long-standing link to a narrative of public sector information and European, European Union directives. In Eastern Europe uh, and Central Asia, it's accountability and anti-corruption initiatives who have got hold of open data, used it in very focused ways, things like open contracting or beneficial ownership transparency or extractive industry transparency. In Asia, our chapter picks up on the fact it's been predominantly national level initiatives till now, but argues that we need to see much more at the local level in order to be able to sustain open data in light of a changing national political climate in many countries. Um, and then we also see real difference in the, the nature of communities, Latin America having a particularly strong multi-stakeholder community where government and civil society work strongly together. And in North America, 
Australia and New Zealand a real narrative of, of open data kind of shifting to government analytics conversations and, and the state taking on how it embeds data practices internally. So that raises all sorts of interesting questions about whether these are just different narratives over the top of a common idea of what open data is or whether we're seeing a bifurcation that's sort of heading off in different directions on a global open data community. And that expansion phase was not only a geographic expansion that saw initiatives in every region of the world, but was also a sectoral expansion that's seen open data in a real wide range of sectors. And we, uh, in this project, have been very informed by the Open Data for Development Network and the International Open Data Conference uh, and things like the G8 Open Data Charter. And we used those to identify 16 different sectors. Uh, there were many more we could have covered, but where open data is in practice and have tried to look at the state of practice around data creation, sharing and use in these different settings. And we see, for example, in agriculture, really uh, large networking initiatives through things like the Global Open Data for Agriculture and Nutrition Network that tries to bring together private sector, public sector and third sector stakeholders to talk about creating open infrastructures. In extractives, we see uh, initiatives like the Extractives Industry Transparency Initiative, long-standing uh, initiative embedding open data in its practices, kind of picking this up as a tool to integrate in what it's doing. In corporate ownership transparency, we see post-financial crisis, open data again becoming a regulator's tool, global legal entity identifiers, things to identify companies being open data baked in due to the advocacy of some key stakeholders and the currency of open data as an idea. Um, but across these sectors, I want to just look at three which have maybe a different story and are quite instructive to look at both where progress has been made, but also areas where there have been challenges. So in government finance, for example, um, government finance work was pivotal in some of the earliest articulation of an open data movement. Where does my money go? So 2007 was a demonstrator of what could happen if governments unlocked their data, made it available, let people see it in new ways. And yet government finance transparency has recently been seen as on, on the decline. Uh, now that might be a countervailing pressure in the world, but that may also show us where open data has not taken hold, even though it, it demonstrated potential, it's not made it as far. In telecommunications, a sector absolutely pivotal to data. Without connectivity, we can't be sharing this data. And yet there's been very little activity to date. It's only in the last year or so that the conversations really emerged about how can we open up data on telecoms in order to think about some of those internet health report issues of who's got access, what sort of access, at what cost. Um, and in urban development, city level, where we've seen so much happen, cities have been an absolutely key venue for open data activity and intersect with many other sectors like transport, health and education. Um, what we've seen in cities, we've seen a, a real trend of uh, the outside agitators for open data being maybe hired in to work for the city, uh, maybe then given the data analytics, the smart cities, the big data agendas as well, and open data becomes less of a, a significant component. So whilst we've seen a real growth in the availability of open data in cities, at the same time over this decade, the amount of city data has grown even more. So we might be absolutely better off in the quantity of urban open data, but relatively, are our cities more open than they were before, or has the landscape changed and open data work not necessarily kept up? So when we put this all together and say sectorally what's going on, we have very much a picture of unfinished business, of foundations laid, uh, some progress made, but at the same time an identification of many more challenges and very high levels of ambition about what open data communities and civic communities want to achieve. And so I think we're, we're, we're now over the first foothill, uh, which we thought was the, you know, the full summit of where we thought we were getting to, but we can really see a massive climb ahead. Um, some people are questioning, should we be turning back at this point? Should we be realising this, this was a pointless journey anyway? I think what comes out of many of these chapters is a, is, a, is a fear that we've got a long way to go, but a sense that we've made it this far, so we need to kind of pursue onwards. We also uh, use a lens of cross-cutting issues. I'm going to try and be very brief in these, these few looking 
at uh, data infrastructure, data literacy questions of gender equity, uh, indigenous rights to data, all sorts of conversations really in the last three or four years that the open data world started to engage with. Um, Perhaps one of the, the biggest ones that's coming on the agenda right now is this question of artificial intelligence. What does this mean for us? Um, and there are a number of different relationships between AI and open data to unpick, but I want to focus on one in particular, which is a tension perhaps between the vision of public problem solving that open data represents and that which machine learning represents, because machine learning approaches do have this tendency to centralize data and analytics, to play down uh, agreements on data structure in place of training machine models to secure desired outcomes, not asking us to understand the input and output, just asking for it to be behaviorally useful to us. On the other hand, a lot of early open data ideas were much more oriented towards creating a sense of a distributed web of data, empowering individuals to make sense of data in their own ways, and bringing data structures and standards into view so that they can be subject to debate, oversight, and scrutiny. And we're at quite a confused part of this debate right now where some are really excited that open data is a fuel for AI, or we can use open data just open up. AI as it's happening but I think what's come out of our analysis is that need to look deeper and say these are these are distinct normative agendas distinct views of the world and we need to be careful that the uh, ethics of openness are not lost in the rush to apply it as a tool to any problem out there um, we also touch uh, very strongly in many of the chapters and we have a chapter on data literacy itself uh, on this argument that open data literacy and data literacy is a massive gap uh, we couldn't find evidence of many more than about 20,000 people in the last 10 years having had kind of data literacy training from open data funders. It's a tiny, tiny number of people when you think about all those who potentially could be using and engaging in a real area of, I think, underinvestment that's, that's created a bottleneck. We've, we've got much more information available, but we're not seeing that wider use. And then we also lastly use a lens of stakeholders, exploring how they've shaped and been shaped by open data. Um, and we see how early alliances in the open data movement, all these groups agreeing that at least they want access to data, start becoming harder <coughs> to sustain when you start talking about what you want to do with it and who it gives power to uh, and how it is used. So governments are now focusing, and, and Barbara really picks this up in a chapter on government engagement, that governments are focusing on the need to develop governance structures to manage this as part of the business of government. And that's immensely positive in a maturing of, of government engagement with data, but also creates new risks of gatekeeping and governments kind of taking back some of the control that was maybe ceded early on. Civil society looking to scale up projects but finding they're maybe in competition with private sector startups in the same space and yet they don't have access to the capital to scale a big civic tech kind of conversation for us to unpack. <coughs> and donors really struggling with working out how to mainstream open data uh, whilst retaining uh, a, a distinct understanding and professional skill set around it. Um, so I'm going to very quickly put up for you the, the 12 conclusions we try and draw out. Uh, I'm not going to talk to all of them in any depth, uh, but uh, very, very briefly, uh, where's, my, where's my notes on the conclusions? Um, uh, two that I'm just going to pick on. One, recommendation for researchers. We need to be comparing open and non-open models. We have lots of case studies that just look at, here was a nice project where we did something open. We haven't got enough work where we say, government could do this through data collaboratives, through machine learning approaches that are proprietary, or could do this in an open way. What's the comparative advantage or disadvantage of those? Not the absolute. We need much more comparative work looking for the natural experiments that we can use. Um, and uh, for funders and for policy makers, we need to, to kind of head forward on some twin tracks of activity. We need to mainstream these ideas. We need to take this into sectoral problem solving, say open data is an approach, is a tool, is a way of solving problems. At the same time, we need to continue to develop the professional skills, the movement around it. And that's a real tension and a juggling act to kind of strike. Um, so that's uh, some of where we're going to. Uh, I'll be happy to tweet this out, share it, and be really keen to get people's thoughts and feedback. 
uh, and more can tell you what's happening. Yeah. Next. First, go to Twitter and follow State of Open Data, so then you can see all of the stuff that we're doing. But uh, we're going to basically release all of these recommendations and next steps for different stakeholders. Our website, our new website, because we already have a website, will be up on the 15th of May. Uh, we are also having a book version. This is the very optimistic draft. It's going to be a bit longer than that. <laughs> uh, but and also available in individual small PDFs. For yeah, the web version. It's all going to be on the web, on a PDF. And if you really want old school, we don't have Kindle though. But we, if you really want old school, go sure like that. We can make a Kindle. Uh, we need you to help us to spread the word. We want this to be useful and uh, not only like sitting on a shelf. So uh, also something that I forgot to say, that with all of our uh, methodology, even though it's a qualitative research, we created some databases. So we have databases of open data initiatives from around the world because of the scans. We have databases of how fun funders are funding, which was hard to do. Uh, so we have many databases that are going to be on the website. They're free and open, because it's open data. Use them uh, and tell them. I, we already uh, have one person who is interested and want to use it, so please do. Uh, and if you want to have a real cool sneak peek, uh, we're going to tweet, uh, we already tweeted it, but we'll retweet our gender equity chapter so you can see what we've done there and how, it, how the chapters look. Um, and that's it. Please use it. Please give us feedback. Um, and that's it from us for now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next we have Matt Stampak and Mika Sivri. Uh, Civic Tech Timeline. Thank you. Switch your slides on. Right ahead of the class, thanks. <laughs> so, hi, I'm Matt Stampak. This is Mika Sivri. Hello. And together with Aliyah Batia and Sruti Modakerti, our amazing research team. We've put together the most comprehensive timeline of civic tech ever attempted. <laughs> We're gonna, it's like a high dive today. Um, I'm very happy that Bex is here because it aligns with some of what she said this morning about the third age of civic tech, which gives us both confidence in our theories. <laughs> this is the timeline of civic tech. It spans 25 years from 1994 to 2018. We're tracking project launches, so discrete projects, not just organizations. We're also looking at Broadly, kind of false dichotomy off the bat, but the tech are the products, the apps, the websites, the data of civic tech, and the social is everything people do. The conferences, the meetups, the funders, kind of the, the field building side of civic tech. So we're looking at both of these from 1994 on, uh, project launches, and where are those coming from? So this is all rooted in a project that Matt and I and a third collaborator, Aaron Simpson, started three years ago called the Civic Tech Field Guide. Uh, in fact, we introduced it at the Tic Tech Conference in Barcelona, I think, yeah. if memory serves, <laughs> uh, the first one. And, um, and we've been crowdsourcing contributions to it ever since then. It was a Google spreadsheet for a while. It is now a full-fledged WordPress site. Uh, it has close to 2,000 entities in it. Uh, and we are uh, looking for you to adopt your project as well as add more data. Um, and so what you're getting here is just a taste of what uh, uh, this is enabling in terms of the field beginning to understand itself better. Um, why are we doing this? Uh, somebody once said to me that fish need to be their own oceanographers. I've never been exactly sure what that means, but um, I do think that uh, it really does help to have a map if you want to figure out where you're going. Um, and looking back at where we have been is the beginning of, of that sense making. Uh, so that's really what we're at here. Uh, what we're going to do today is, is focus on three research questions um, coming out of this very simple thing that we have done, which is collect the start dates for all the current entities in the guide. Um, and so there are three questions we want to get to. The first one is just, is our field growing? How much is it growing? Is it still growing? Uh, and we'll get to that in a second. This is what I'm interested in is, you know, this field started with open data portals and issue reporting apps and legislation commenting apps. Has it gotten more complicated since then? And we're going to measure this by category diversity of the projects. So in the Civic Tech Field Guide, we track 232 different subcategories of Civic Tech. That's how we're going to try to answer this question. 
And to Stefan's point about talking about the limitations of your data when you share your data, there are many with this. This is hand-collected artisanal data. Uh, this is crowdsourced data. This is you know, 2,000 or so projects from the guide, which is the largest data set available in Civic Tech for chron chronology. But it's not perfect. And for one example, there's um, unevenness across categories. The other day, I found a set of Canadian innovation labs, public innovation labs. And if I imported that right now, it would skew a bunch of our results. So with a grain of salt, we're going to explore this data set. This data set is Creative Commons, like everything else on the field guide. So if you want it, just come ask us. All we ask is attribution and non-commercial use cases. OK. So uh, the first thing to say is that there are other timelines. Um, for example, there's one that uh, I built with a, with a bunch of collaborators back when we were running our site, techpresident.com. It's a timeline of important interventions at the intersection of uh, the internet and politics. Um, and it's still there. You can find it at techpresident.com slash timeline. Another really interesting timeline uh, recently posted by Sid Harrell, who is a civic design expert, um, is a look at key events that are primarily in the United States in the evolution of civic design practice. Uh, we love these kinds of uh, qualitative timelines. It's important to note that they are really subjective, culturally subjective, inevitably deciding what's important is, is a subjective decision. Um, and so that what we've tried to do here with what we're presenting today is a little more data driven. So let's start in the 1990s um, when, uh, you know, for the purposes of our conversation, it's important to note that there is precursors to civic tech before the 1990s. Uh, there was a whole conversation about appropriate technology uh, in the late 1960s. Uh, you then see, for example, the field of ICT for D, interactive communications technology for development, uh, which is still going, uh, that I think really starts to pick up in the 70s and 80s. But for our purposes, this is really about uh, what people started to do once the internet uh, became something that lots of people could not only read but write on. And so the first thing to notice here is that in the earliest days, and, and this is just the, the tail end of the long timeline we're going to show you, uh, that really around 1994 is when things start to pick up um, in terms of a variety of initiatives. Uh, this is not a coincidence. 1994 is when uh, the Mosaic, the Netscape browser, uh, was, was published, and people finally began to use the web uh, outside of just uh, academic specialists who knew how to do that. Um, so a couple of key events in the 1990s, there are many, but just a few examples. The first website built by a, uh, a federal elected official in the United States was uh, Ted Kennedy. Uh, the first 311 reporting uh, project done by the city of Baltimore, which is a precursor to many, many, many examples of cities starting to collect data. Uh, e Estonia, there's somebody here from Estonia I was talking to before. Where are you? Raise your hand. Oh, maybe she left. Um, so, you know, the, the many examples of uh, what we now refer back to as e government. The field thought of itself as e democracy and e government. Um, I find it ironically funny that we're back at the OECD to talk about this. Um, but the pattern starts to change during the 90s, and uh, I really want to call this pattern out quickly, which is uh, a lot of early individual pioneers doing something that strikes a chord and then grows into an entire category of civic tech. In the bottom right corner, how many people recognize who that is? That's Carl Malamud, um, who in, the, in 1994 uh, basically took a government data set, the S Securities and Exchange Commission reports that companies have to file if they're publicly traded, and he turned it into an open, freely available resource that you could get online. He did it for two years until his NSF grant ran out, and then he basically told his big user community, if you want this to continue, here's Al Gore's phone number and email address, here's the phone number and e email address of the head of the SEC, tell them that it should be a government uh, service, and lo and behold, the SEC took it over. Um, the, working our way around the, the group, uh, Vivek Kundra, who uh, basically was the CTO of Washington, D.C., held the very first open government, open data hackathon, uh, opening up the city's data and inviting hackers in to play with it. Jen Palka, who had 
the idea of creating a fellowship program to bring tech talent into serving government with Code for America, Oriokolo of Ushahidi, while there were other earlier examples of people just getting together to do crisis response using things like blogs, um, it was Ushahidi that really turned that into a platform solution for many examples, not just crisis response or election monitoring or beyond. So that pattern is what then propels us into the degree of innovation we see in the 2000s. So 25 years is a long time in technology, it's several generations, and while curating this data, we found a couple of, instance, a couple of interesting instances. One is that uh, evote.com has seen several different projects start and close on the same domain name. And the people-powered brigades at Code for America have won the namespace against the millions, tens of millions of dollars funding brigade. So we've seen a lot of different things come and go in civic tech over 25 years. But we survived Y2K, we head into the 2000s, and as Bex was saying earlier, this is a big decade of technical experimentation. We have map mashups, it's the golden age of app mashups. We get social media platforms. We get people throwing spaghetti at the wall, all kinds of things, making nifty, co nifty code to help people and putting it online, as Bex said this morning. We really see that start to happen. It's more the technical side of the field before the, the social side. And towards the end of the decade, you know, journalism products, more open data happening, begin to emerge. Um, you know, they, the predecessor of They Work For You in 2004 uh, spawns a whole bunch of My Society projects that get adopted around the world and used by millions. Google Maps API, I was interested to learn that it came out after housingmaps.org and Chicago Crime Map. So people were mashing up data on maps before the API was even there for it. And then of course the API itself spawned a whole new generation of mapping in civic tech. And then towards the end of the decade, we get things like bar camps, more social things, Code for America starts to hack the bureaucracy and the social side of government tech, which brings us to the 2010s. Right, and this is where we think that the social side of tech, of civic tech, really flowers. Um, the bulk of what we found, yes, and we are still in the 2010s. I know it's hard to believe. It feels like a century has passed in just 10 years. Um, the 2010s is when civic tech becomes self-referential. Okay, this is the field now beginning to talk about itself as civic tech. Probably the, the, uh, the big bang moment for that is a major report that the Knight Foundation put out at the end of December 2013, uh, analyzing the emergence of civic tech, focused on uh, where money was being invested. I don't see Tom Steinberg here at the moment, but Tom also wrote a, a post uh, right around the same time, beginning of 2014, talking about civic tech winning the name game. Um, this is also a moment, I think, where, uh, uh, if you could go to the next slide, Matt, where you also see the, the sort of knowledge curation side really begin to explode. In the, in the field, we see, uh, in terms of books, newsletters, policy research, that 2013 is a, is a big uh, date in terms of the number of launches of new projects centered on knowledge, creation, courses, catalogs, and so on. About civic tech. These are all meta civic tech courses, catalogs, curation. Right. Um, next slide. Yep. The other big change, and you'll see this when we show you, well, we, will, we can't show you the fully interactive version of this because we're working with Internet Explorer here, we just discovered. <laughs> but um, that in 2013 is where uh, civic hacking meetups, the launching of civic hacking meetups uh, really explodes. Um, and that is, uh, we thought, another really key, uh, basically confirmation to uh, uh, another point that, that we heard this morning uh, about the social side of tech, really, of civic tech really taking off uh, in the last five, six years. So to the big picture. Yeah, so zooming out, this is 10 years here, just abstracted of tech and social. We see a lot of growth starting in 2008, bring us to where we are now. You'll see a bit of a decline here in, in projects launched. So I'm gonna get into that. But back to our research questions. Has the field grown? What do you guys think? Yeah. Yell it. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yay. And is it still growing? So has it grown? Yeah, that's an easy one. Uh, by projects launch, we see lots more. Um, through 2007 is really where it starts to spike and grow into where we are now. And here's maybe a more helpful histogram of that happening. So around 2007, we get this crescendo. And this is new projects launched per year. So it's not like projects in the space. It's not. We're not condensing right here. 
2016, in our data set, we have the most launches that year. So yes, but importantly is the field is still growing. And what we find is it's starting to taper off the rate of growth. Yes, it's still growing. It's not condensing. But in our projects, uh, the rate of growth is slowing. Green here is project launches per year, just the absolute number of project launches per year. The blue line is the trend. It's the year-over-year -year growth from the year before. So although the space is still growing, we're seeing in 2017, 2018, a little bit of slowing, which optimistic interpretation, to Rebecca's point this morning, might be that we're beginning to see what works and we're funding those things rather than 100 different experiments every year. Um, maybe. Our data isn't really good enough to say that. So maybe it's still growing as sharply as we think. It'd be really nice to know, you know, budget size of organizations, headcount of organizations, other impact metrics besides just the year they were launched. So limits of our data set right there, pretty, pretty prevalent. Has the field grown more interesting and complicated from a category count from where it used to be? What do you guys think? Yeah, you're the right conference. <laughs> <laughs> so these are some of the 230 categories we track on the Civic Tech Field Guide. This might seem overwhelming, but for us, there's a big difference between people doing work to visualize a national government budget or people launching a, an electoral campaign using relational organizing tools that access your contacts on your phone. Those are entirely different subgenres of civic tech. We think they belong together, but also it's more useful if they're you know, listed separately. So here we have, in 2008, projects were launched across 43 different categories of civic tech. And by 2018, projects were launched across 72 different categories of civic tech. So we're seeing sophistication in a number of different ways, both category diversification, we're seeing entire NGOs spun up to be the intermediaries of civic tech partnerships between large institutions, and even the lowly civic hackathon has gotten more specific and, and expert. Uh, we're seeing more hackathons about the hyper-local areas or hyper-specific topics like the breast pump hackathon, rather than just, we have data, what can we do with it, everybody come to one room. And eat okay. pizza. And eat pizza. We still eat pizza. <laughs> this is what you can view online. If you go right now to civictech.guide slash timeline, you'll be able to hover over each of these squiggly tapestry lines to see the category legend. Um, unfortunately, it does not yet work with Internet Explorer. We'll figure out the <laughs> JavaScript there. Uh, but real thanks to Sruti Motokurti who helped us visualize this work and Ilya Batia who helped us analyze it. Um, 25 years, we're seeing a, a lot of growth and diversity of, of categories. And yes, we think it has grown more complicated even with our limited data set. So last point, how useful is this data? So this, use, this data is the product of a ongoing effort. Um, we want to continue to complexify it right now we have to add lots of caveats because it is, as Matt said, artisanally collected. Um, it has a tilt towards the Anglo-Saxon world, given who we are, though we have had contributions from more than 80 countries, and we continue to add to it. So one thing we absolutely plan to do is as we add more content to the guide, we will run this timeline again so that it, it hopefully shows a little bit more detail uh, that we can trust. The second thing is, as Matt will explain, is we're also planning to go back into our metadata and add other kinds of uh, things that we want to track. Yeah, and one point on why we think it might be useful data, we really expected to find a recency bias. So just organizationally, we've been paying a lot more attention to the Civic Tech Field Guide in the past two years, so we expect to see a lot more projects from those two years represented, but we don't. We saw the uh, fewer 2017, 2018 projects, even though that's when we were looking the most. So that gives us some hope that the data is not supervised. Well, we actually have a theory about that, which is that um, that either, uh, well, it's one of three things. One is intermediary filters, organizations, and knowledge banks that are convincing people they, they shouldn't just try uh, whatever idea that they have. The second is that the throw spaghetti up a, against the wall approach uh, isn't working as much because there's a lot of spaghetti taking up most of the space on the wall. And the third possibility is that some people have finally realized that there's certain parts of the wall where the spaghetti will simply not stick and they're not going to keep trying those ideas. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> uh, just real quick looking forward, uh, civic tech is increasingly high tech. AI came up with, the, with Tim's last presentation. 
uh, virtual reality and augmented reality are getting cheaper and more accessible. Sensors are getting cheaper, allowing projects like HeatSeek NYC. Uh, and then blockchain is still a thing and being used <laughs> for lots of public companies. So maybe you know, 10 years from now, we'll all be here at the, the impacts of blockchain tech conference. How do you know? No. No. <laughs> we got Tib Tech. Tib Tech. That will never happen. Never. <laughs> So Miga alluded to some future directions we'd like to continue to interrogate this data, we'd like to improve the data. We're interested in longevity of these organizations. Right now we're just looking at project launches. What about the, the year they shut down? Or maybe it's a one-off like a report launch, that's fine, we want to know that. So right now we have the, the year ended data for about 60 organizations out of 2,000. It'd be really great to expand that and look at sustainability in civic tech by category. We could look at uh, slices by geography of civic tech and we're also interested in founder diversity, uh, both by gender and ethnicity, especially in the US. So that's the website. I should say all the data from the guide comes directly from civictech.guide. So the timeline is populated with whatever is in the database. So if you find yourself missing from the timeline, it's really easy to go put yourself there. Uh, but yeah, and then if you go to slash timeline, that's the interactive JavaScript pretty tapestry of civic tech. It's really quite the metaphor. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. And that's it. Thank you. Um, thank you to Perfect. all our speakers. I'm not going to get the microphone ahead sound of my own voice. Um, please have another round of applause for that impeccable timing. Nobody. <laughs> so that leaves us with about 10 minutes for questions. And that kind of depends on you. It could be one 10 minute question or 10 <laughs> one minute questions. Um, so we start with later with then, uh, Alex. Uh, super quick question. I'm sorry, I'm going to. It's just a cynical, uh, but very different to announce. How did. Um, it's self populating, but have you knocked anything out that you thought wasn't civic tech? Mm -hmm. One. And two, have you thought of a way of. Have you explored, like, looking at the GitHub repo to see how many people are contributing to a project? Because if you've got one project mm -hmm. with 20,000 volunteers yeah. and one with two blokes in a shed, yeah. they're different sizes of impact. Yeah. Um, I think Stefan should take the second question about GitHub contributors to civic tech projects, <laughs> given your research. But uh, on the first question, yes, we do actually curate in terms of say no to things. And we don't want it to be just like a social impact tech project that's like everything ever. Uh, one way we define what's civic tech, what's not, is is it for the public good in the sense that it's helping a shared challenge versus a private challenge? So there's a lot of urban tech out there that helps you get through traffic more quickly and that might not be for the good of society, that's just for you getting to work faster, versus you know, maybe something that helps reduce congestion and air pollution in the entire city might be more civic tech. So we do exclude purely promotional, super, uh, super commercial with no clear public benefit um, entries. Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> so uh, besides working for Mozilla, I also did research on civic tech before. Uh, and one of the things I studied was uh, civic tech on GitHub, so this is why. <laughs> um, the problem is it's, a few, few, it's been a few years since I did this research, <laughs> so I have to, but uh, what I remember is that the long tail is pretty long, basically. Mm -hmm. We have a few repos that have like a lot of contributors, but they are a lot of smaller ones. Um, and it's like, I, I don't think you can quantitatively say which ones should be emphasized and which one isn't. It's really like a question of context. So mm -hmm. I think it's hard to do that on scale. Mm -hmm. so. But I would love to have more proxies for influence in these projects. CivicGraph.io, the Microsoft project, has uh, the bubbles are sized by either team headcount or budget, which I think is, is better than just chronology, maybe. I'd love to add that. Three fantastic presentations. I couldn't help feeling um, that they would be added to with looking at the kind of the context in which all of these things are operating and whether or not they, in general, are contributing to a greater public good. So you know, if open data is is having tremendous uh, impacts in a small way, whilst actually data, in, in, you know, in the public sector in, in in general is going backwards or civic space is shrinking in general, you know, civic as we're here, I think. They uh, the shrinking civil civic space around the world. So I'm, I'm just um, really keen that these amazing initiatives and all of this inspiring work and leadership is also looking at its kind of role in that broader context and, and making sure that we're kind of taking that lens as well. 
I yeah, so maybe just like, I, I absolutely resonates in something all the chapters we've got in the sectorally do try and look at that wider context and say what are the what are the problems in the field and these are they can work connecting with those. And we really see variation across fields. So uh, one of the first chapters on accountability and anti corruption says this this in itself is a young field still working out its theories of change, how it affects change and data is kind of entering into that. In other spaces, um, say agriculture, we've got long established work Really, we're still just doing things around the edges. We're not really getting to the heart of the kind of structural issues in those spaces, like we said in government, government finance. We've we've got some solutions, but we've not dealt with the politics and the power of play in the decision making. So I think um, maybe to connect back to all the presentations we've seen, one thing that really struck us in putting the book together is a lot of practices relatively ahistorical and context free, and we need to be much better at teaching people the history and getting people to think about context. Uh, you know, the, the web of civic tech and open data is a graveyard of broken links for the people <laughs> that believe in. You know, we have appalling archival practice as a sector. We need to sort that out. We need to know our history, know our context, and engage with that local lot better in order to have more impact. So it just feels like there's a shared purpose here, which is about societal transformation. Um, and so the question that I, I want to see is addressing more is, uh, are, are there insights about how we can push that transformation uh, further by learning how some of the things are landing or being recaptured by the existing power dynamics? Mm -hmm. uh, cities are grabbing the you know, data agenda and making it less open. Is that something we should be worried about? How do we make sure the act is Yeah, <clears throat> and on a positive token, um, something Beck said this morning that really resonated with me is maybe also civic tech gets harder to track because it, it, as we succeed, it becomes more diffuse. I, I have this like giant Venn diagram in my head where civic tech emerge from you know urban planning, government, politics, journalism, and communities. The tech kind of brought these spaces together, and maybe they'll go back to being individual disciplines. I hope not because I think there's value in that crossover space. But as we succeed, maybe we don't have a name for the field. It's just like how you do cities and how you do politics and how you do government. Yeah, if I could just add one tiny quick comment. I, I also think this morning's keynote from Alexandra Orofino was important in terms of this field, this community's evolution, moving, and it may just be, you know, a blip and not yet a trend, but uh, the fact that, for example, Luminate, previously Omidyar Network, which has funded a lot of civic tech, is now talking about civic empowerment. Um, the Mozilla Internet Health, there, there are normative judgments being made here uh, or, or being pushed at. So I think your, your question is welcome, and I think that it is one of the things that is in the background of a lot of our minds. Uh, gentlemen here, and then the, the, the. Well, first, thanks to all the presenter. It was a quite inspiring session. I have many questions, but I will have a question for Matt and for Mika. And uh, last week, I was with some colleagues uh, from Miguel Prado in Madrid, in the data analysis group for the site of Madrid. Uh, and one colleague said I, he had a friend who was interested in doing a mapping of city technology. I said, oh, that sounds quite cool, but have you found that there are many guides already? Like, there's this feeling can start from the Argentinian people like some years ago, but then it went this OGP to the books that it has some nice categories that you, you can it. navigate through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, from Sweden, there is also this DigiDem uh, lab with the guy. Mm -hmm. We in Barcelona did some other mapping for doing this in Barcelona as well. There is the research of my society, there is the research of the Net Foundation, the Participedia, there is the government repositories. We have 40 catalogs in our. Mozilla, we have a catalog ca category. Catalog. And there's so 40. Finally, we, yeah. like, we have so many repositories of yeah. that. And we are having the. Uh, actually, I found. Uh, look, there's this TV tech guy. I, I sent you the. the your Thank case. you. It's cool. It's got some map, finally. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing mapping. It loads really, really slowly. And I really enjoy that now you have seen some other value like this longitudinal analysis. Yeah. So, from all this observation, what I found is like, do we have to make a new guide every time we have an investigation? Like, how can we have some kind of maybe a Wikipedia of this kind of. Yeah. A week of this kind of tools? or not having to reinvent the wheel every time that we have a new yeah. question around the civic tech ecosystem. You might be happy to hear that at Code for All Summit in Bucharest, we got together some of the curators and said, how could we exchange metadata? How could we share all of our, maybe should we use wiki data so that every time we find something, it also goes into Siri and Alexa and everything powered by wiki data. 
Um, so we're definitely working on that. For us, it's just a technical limitation of how much development time we have. That's literally the only barrier, but we're all philosophically aligned on that. There is a metadata standard called public code.yml, YAML, uh, that I believe was started by Public Code Foundation in the Netherlands and adopted by the government of Italy. And that would allow anyone pushing a civic tech project to GitHub to, to describe the project in a standard way that any crawler could pick up and use. But there's only 40 or so projects on GitHub using it. <laughs> and, uh, but Nick and, and Matt, I love the walk on memory lane there. It was really fantastic. I would also recommend Nika's uh, Civic Tech Graveyard, which contains it's all in the, 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 uh, <laughs> the cautionary tales. Yeah. Uh, but I, I wanted to uh, thank you all, too, for including uh, the, the point about AI and what's emerging even this morning, the idea that what's coming next could be very different from what we see today. I think there's kind of a tension emerging between how much of, of the future of our world is going to be automated and how much is participation and where the two fit together and what the ratio is. Uh, and also the, the point about open data, I think I actually just want to toss back to you and ask Mark, Senator Mark Warner put out a report uh, with recommendations about dealing with technology, but, but he made a very good point that uh, data is valuable to different actors in different ways. So if you're sitting on a mountain of data and you get another open data set, it's immensely valuable to you. And even though it's available to everyone equally, yes, I know data as oil is not always the best analogy, but if you own a refinery, you know what to do with it. And even if oil is free to, to all, we don't all know what to do with it. Uh, so as in, in the OGP, uh, world, as you're thinking about access to uh, open data and making data available in the future, has there been some discussion about those organizations that benefit from the open data helping to support the, uh, the tools for others to make use of it in perhaps a public context? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think there's two parts in that. Yeah. The conversation about open data and AI is vastly underdeveloped right now, and so it's a key kind of conversation to, to dig into. In terms of that idea of people who've got the power through having proprietary data and everything they can mix, or the tools, I think there's all sorts of conversation about data collaboratives, data trust governance systems to do that, and that, that is an important part of it. But I think you touched on the other important part, which is the configuration of data sets that are out there affect who can do what. It comes back to that internet um, health report question of who's empowered by this, and, and something I'm particularly interested in is our role as uh, watching the, the development of ecosystems and infrastructures of data and our need to address those very consciously to say, if there are biases coming out of the system, what data do we need to make sure is available to address those biases? If there are inequalities of power in the system, what do we need to be careful about releasing in order to make sure this doesn't lead to, to great regular exploitation. So I think certainly something that comes out from the, the work is the simple binary, open, not open, is no longer kind of easy to su sustain. There is a big risk there that that pulls us in the direction of the easiest path is much more closed, hanging out the people who say they'll solve the course, they'll automate away those troubles. And, and it, it challenges us, I think, to go back to some of those roots of civic tech, where the participatory, the data, uh, and those other forms of work were much more intertwined. And I don't know if it comes out of your story, but, but I think we've seen data civic tech organizations, participatory tech organizations, perhaps not as connected as maybe they might have been back in the 2000s. And also being part of Open Data for Development and having a lot of authors coming also from the global south help, help us to see different power dynamics, which I think it's also what makes us unique. So yes, we are from the global north, but we did try to make sure that we do get this feedback and try to see these power dynamics from different eyes. So it does help us to get it, and there's a lot about power uh, in the book as well. I think the Africa chapter speaks about it. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa chapter speaks about it a lot. Um, so hopefully that will help with also looking at this. But the data literacy part, I think, it's and the web literacy is the way forward in trying to understand how we can get more people to actually understand what to do with data. Um, I think an interesting aspect to it is also and it ties with open data and also open content such as for example pictures or license under creative commons uh, licensing i don't know if you heard recently there was a scandal with uh, ibm using um, the Flickr uh, package a whole package of 
images uh, licensed under free license for uh, for training uh, their machine learning. Uh, so I think we need to ask ourselves also a question: the consent that was has been given a long time ago, where none of us were imagining yet in the future how this data might be used. Uh, well, what's the, what does the consent mean now? And if we need to think about new licensing or new uh, processes uh, um, to, to handle that problem. I would be also curious to think if you have to, to ask if you have any any thoughts on that regarding open data. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we'll go on. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think I think regarding open data, we having a lot of looking at how open data is basically shaping AI, but also what is the hype or what is not the hype coming into it and who is shaping this conversation because personally not the book i think that we have a lot of hype there that we need to untangle and understand exactly what we're speaking about uh, but we do have a whole uh, chapter on privacy that also touch about ethics and how we're going into it and we also have to touch about ethics in ai and what does it mean as a whole big uh, data movement because I think that one of the way forward is it's not open data can't be in a vacuum and civic tech can't be in a vacuum and we all need to look at it as a bigger data movement and how we connect these silos going forward. So it's not only Mozilla working in a vacuum uh, and civic hall working in a vacuum but how do we create those discussions between practitioners and then how we bring this discussion for practitioners actually forward the ground and I think this is the next hurdle forward that Hopefully, if there's a funder in the room, I'm looking at Matt, that will help you <laughs> to, uh, to think how we make this uh, conversation actually on the ground as well, and not only in the So I'm, I'm afraid we're out of time. Um, I'd love to let the conversation go on, but there's buses to go. Uh, thank you, everybody. Alternative drinks. Yeah, it's very, very Good job.